What up, my boy? Welcome to the Teenology Podcast, where teens make sense of the world that they are about to change. I'm your host, Aiden Middleton, and I'm excited to be here with you guys, sitting next to this man I call my dad. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Just the man I call my dad. Yeah. Yeah. Alrighty. You're well, you've actually had that. worse than that, so I can't you, complain that much. More than that to me. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't complain that much about that. <laughs> All right, Aiden. Well, yet again, believe it or not, we have another special episode. No. Uh. Not only did we convince nobody saw this coming. I know. Right. What a surprise. <laughs> not only did we convince Pastor Keith Tower to be interviewed by you once. Is that an insult? Kind of, yeah. We actually wow. convinced him to be intervi- interviewed by you a second time. So we have another, just another special episode. We're just adding <laughs> credibility layer upon layer to our little podcast here. Yeah. But first, you know what time it is. Yeah. It's time for the Gen Z word of the episode. Yeah. It's not yeah, but here we go. Let's go. All right, Aiden, I got a word for you. Let's hear it. This word sounds to me like it's from the the 50s or something like that. <laughs> Whoa. Yes. And the oh, word is that one coming. The word is bop. Oh. Oh my don't bop. Don't say that. It literally it hurts my ears. I I hate when people say that. You don't like the word bop? I hate it. It is the, it is my biggest pet peeve. I'm is sorry. when somebody talks about a song that they like and they're like, "Dude, this is a bop." I'm like, "You can call it anything else in the world." It, songs I feel like a bop is a degrading term or something. I don't it like sounds it. like it's from the '50s, to be honest. Yeah, I don't like it at all. I have a question for you, Aiden. I would ask every single person listening to this episode right now to never say that word and tell everybody else that you know to never say that word. We'll see if we can start a movement right here on yes. this podcast. I will sign so a petition. I do have a question for you, though. What? You like the band 21 Pilots. How do you know? I know, because I know. <laughs> and so tell me, what 21 pa- uh, Pilots oh no, song is your coming. favorite bop? <laughs> I can't even answer that. What is it? I don't know. I can't answer. None of their songs are bops. They're all just great songs. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Well, let's get to the interview. All right, guys. We are here with the second portion of this small series on mental health with Pastor Keith Tower. And if you guys missed the first episode of this series, please go back and check it out. Very impactful. Uh, We covered the um, just overall mental health, what it is, and how it affected teenagers in general. And today we are going to be covering um, topics of like depression and suicide and things like that. So my first question for you today is what are some natural causes of depression? Uh, yeah, first of all, it's good to be back with you again. Man, I really enjoyed our conversation last time and yeah. um, I, I'm so grateful uh, for your podcast and so grateful that you're having this uh, conversation because I think it's going to be super helpful for teenagers. So, yeah. uh, what is depression? So depression is, is a, I mean, there's a big clinical definition that'll go kind of beyond the scope of this, but it's mm-hmm. basically when our sadness, which is a normal emotion, God gives us a range of emotions so that we can experience the fullness of life, right? There are things that happen in our life that should make us sad. God forbid our dog dies or, a you know, uh, you're watching a sad movie to, to really experience the fullness of life as God's created us, yeah. we have a wide range of emotions. Where depression slips in is not just when I'm sad or not even when I'm super sad or not even when I'm super duper duper sad. Yeah. It's when I'm sad to the point where I can no longer function. Uh, and by that, I mean that where I would think and behave like I normally do. Mm-hmm. So it's one thing to be sad. It's another thing to be sad to the point where I can't get out of bed, uh, where I can't concentrate at school, mm-hmm. where... Um, you know, the th- type of thoughts I have kind of start going dark and I start thinking about possibly the world would be better if I wasn't here. When we start to move into that realm, kind yeah. of a, there's no like super hard and fast line of depression other than to say sad is normal when it's a sad event. Uh, we mm-hmm. talked last time about um, one form of mental health 
is when I have an abnormal response to a normal life situation or a normal response to an abnormal life situation. Yeah. It's normal when sad things happen to feel sad. Mm -hmm. The question is, does the sadness now move to a place where my response goes beyond sad to a little bit in the abnormal range to where I also can't think and behave as well. So what, what are some things that can cause depression? Uh, yeah, great question. So there's, there's two primary types of depression. There's a, a what we would call a, a biological form and then a situational mm-hmm. form. Yeah. So biological would mean that sometimes our, our brain just maybe doesn't f- function right. And there could be a biochemical situation. About 20% in America, about 20% of depressions fall into what we would consider having a physical cause. There's something yeah. going on in the brain. Chemicals are working in such a way that that it causes our mood to slip into the, the, the realm of depression. Yeah. Uh, the other 80%, which is the vast majority of, of the, the things we feel are situational in nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, maybe a series of repeated disappointments. That was one of the things, as we mentioned last week, uh, with the pandemic possibly playing a role, or uh, a series of sad things stack up. Gosh, your, your parents aren't getting along. Maybe they're divorced. Maybe I didn't do well on my test. Maybe I, I got cut from a team that I was yeah. really counting on. You pile all those things together, and and it would take a superhuman effort to not slip into uh, depression based on situational yeah. factors, moving my sadness level just a little beyond healthy. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So staying on that point of uh, biological and situational depression, how are some ways we can help people who have chronic depression from chemical imbalances opposed to temporary or situational depression? Uh, yeah, so those that are that find themselves uh, struggling with, and their depression is based in chemical imbalances or has a physical, biological component, mm-hmm. you would treat it like you would most things that are that are physical in nature, and that would be with uh, some of the mood medications. Yeah, and you know sometimes, especially sometimes in the Christian world, we can get a little kind of weird with. Oh no, you're on medication as if, as if somehow my depression is a lack of faith or my depression is a, a, an issue of sin. A- and it's not. The brain is an organ just like the heart, uh, yeah. just like you know your skin, right? We've, if you have a rash, you put skin medication on it to treat the rash. If, you're, if your brain chemistry as an organ is not functioning properly, there are medications that will help balance the chemicals out. Mm-hmm. And what many of the mood medications do is they just... That you you don't want to take it so much that you kind of become a, a zombie and you're like oh yay I'm happy it's my birthday right or yeah. oh gee my dog died I'm so sad and they're like you you don't feel yeah but what they do if taken properly is just kind of put a hard stop on the range of emotions so you would feel sad you would feel happy you would feel nervous but you wouldn't slide into that place of debilitation it keeps you from crossing over to where it would impact your ability to to think or to behave. Yeah. We mentioned the the biological cause is about 20%, which leaves about another 80%. Uh, and that would be, can be treated with medication if I can't kind of get a hold of my thinking or my behavior. If I'm debilitated, sometimes medication can take a little bit of the edge off, yeah. which would then allow um, what a, a counselor would do or what a friend would do. Mm-hmm. And that would help you to work on both your thinking uh, and and your actions, right? So our feelings are really a response to how we think and to how we behave. Um, yeah. So if we can start thinking more positive thoughts, I know there was a, an episode y'all did about about how, we, how it is that we think, and I, if I can get a control of my thoughts, uh, that can certainly help my mood. Um, another thing would be physical activity is a great uh, mood enhancer. Get out, move around in the sunlight, yeah. Uh, sometimes, you know, there are people that live in certain parts of the country where their mood is affected by the weather, right? Yeah. In the Pacific Northwest where it's just gray, that the fact that you can't go outside or when you do go outside, it just feels gray. That almost that gray almost gets on the inside. Yeah. And one of the best things you can do is get out and move in sunlight. Mm-hmm. And and all of a sudden the effects of, of sunlight, the effects of physical activity have a way of impacting our mood. Yeah. So as a Christian, what can we do to fight feelings, depression, and suicide? Uh, yeah, so um, I, I think we have a couple things sort of built in as followers of Christ. Uh, mm-hmm. Number one is that we have hope. Yeah. Uh, hope is the greatest antidote for all that ails, I think, uh, humanity. 
um, you know, the, a sense of an optimism for the future, even if all else fails, I'll be with Christ someday for eternity. Yeah. Then in comparison to the glory of what that would look like in eternity with Christ, nothing on this earth can be bad enough to outweigh the glory of eternity. With yeah. So if all else fails, my world is terrible. I can still take hope in an eternity that I have in Jesus Christ. So that yeah, that's, that's huge. And then on a very kind of non meta, you know, eternal scale, uh, hope impacts me today and that uh, I have the spirit of God. I'm forgiven of my sins and Jesus walks with me every day. Yeah. So I can get up and literally just face tomorrow uh, knowing that if God's for me, who could be against me? Mm -hmm. um, we also tend to have or should have, if we're in uh, followers of Jesus, would be Christian community. One of the greatest buffers against depression and suicidal tendencies is good friends. Yeah. People that, that think, they don't, you don't have to agree on every single thing, but, but people that are, are for me, people that would encourage me. I have an outlet for service into the world where I can mm -hmm. do things that are purposeful and productive. And those are uh, great um, kind of buffers against feelings of depression. And also I can pray and literally talk to a God who cares about every detail of my life. And uh, one of the biggest buffers against suicide, honestly, is knowing that somebody cares. In yeah. fact, if you're on here and you have a, you're, you're feeling suicidal or you have a friend that's expressed that they might be suicidal, the number one research bears it out, the Bible bears it out, the single most important thing you can do if you're feeling suicidal or know somebody that's feeling suicidal is to talk to another human being about it. Mm -hmm. And what you find is somebody that cares. And the number one antidote for, uh, you talk to folks who have been on the brink of suicide that didn't go through with it almost exclusively, they said they spoke with somebody and realized that somebody cared. Mm. And if all else fails and you're by yourself, you have a God that cares, he hears and he responds. And that's something I think that cannot be, you know, taken too lightly as followers of Jesus. Yeah, so powerful. So you just briefly mentioned about what we can do as uh, teenagers to help friends that have feelings of depression and suicide. So just can you elaborate on that a little more? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, I would say if somebody in here is feeling suicidal or has a friend that they're concerned about that might think they're suicidal, the single most important thing you can do is talk to somebody. If you have a friend that you're just kind of you're thinking, gosh, they've sort of dropped some hints, like maybe the world would be better if I wasn't here, or man, I, I, I just don't feel like I should want to be alive. If you, if you hear those things, for a teenager, it can feel like, I don't know what to do. Yeah. Just ask them, hey, it sounds like you're saying you might want to hurt yourself. Are you considering hurting yourself? Are you consider, considering killing yourself? Ask them directly. And mm -hmm. I know that can sound counterintuitive, like I don't want to ask them and put the idea in their head. Yeah. Well, if you were not considering suicide and someone walked up to you and said, are you, are you considering suicide? And you weren't, you're, you would go, no, <laughs> and blow them off. You wouldn't suddenly go, hmm, no, I wasn't. But now that you mention it, I think I'm going to. Like, you, yeah. you're not going to plant the idea. Yeah. Right? So we, we don't have to have fear of that. If they are considering suicide, and they're saying those things that sort of drop hints by you directly asking them what you're saying is, I care enough about you and you being here to ask you. And that alone can literally save a life. Here's the other thing why it's super important to, if you're feeling suicidal, to talk to somebody or if, if you are concerned about a friend, to ask them about it is because uh, whatever you think you're going to solve by committing suicide, you will actually make that very thing worse. Yeah. No matter, in every occasion of every suicide, whatever it is that you think is gonna get better is actually gonna get worse. And to talk mm. with somebody trusted, like you can think, well, the world's not gonna care if I disappear and someone goes, I'd be heartbroken. You're, you're, you're actually challenging the lie that they're holding that, that nobody cares and their life doesn't matter by saying, you, you matter to me. Right. Okay. So mm -hmm. what you're now telling them is whatever it is that they think is going to get better is actually not. It's actually going to be made worse for everybody else uh, that's left behind. And when yeah. when people, are, if you have friends and you're concerned, 
if they might be suicidal, really three things to, to keep in mind, kind of the, the big three that, that um, contribute to being people being suicidal is, is something they call thwarted belongingness, which <laughs> it's kind of a fancy way of saying, I, I don't know where I fit, yeah. right? So it's the kid in the lunchroom that nobody sits by ever. Where does he fit? One of yeah. the things we can do as followers of Jesus is, is open up our circle and uh, include one more. So yeah. thwarted belonging, pe- people don't know where their place is in the world. And by the way, that is one of the most common feelings in middle school and high school because your body's changing, your interests are changing, your peer groups are changing. You know, you have your, your, your best friend from third grade and you're like, we're going to be best friends forever until you're in eighth grade. And you don't, you're not <laughs> even interested in the same things anymore. Yeah. And finding where do I fit and where do I belong is very, very difficult. That's one of the primary uh, drivers of suicide among middle and high schoolers. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing is what we call perceived burdensomeness. And that simply means I feel like I'm a burden, right? My parents are divorcing and I feel like if I wasn't such a needy person, if I wasn't doing so poorly in school, if I, you know, my parents lost their job and if I didn't just want to eat so much or want Xbox so much, you know, and we, we start to feel that somehow I'm a, I'm a burden yeah. and the world would actually be better off if I wasn't in it. And then the third thing that's really probably the biggest red flag is what we call capacity for, for self-harm. People who have already sort of crossed a threshold of being okay with hurting themselves. Yeah. Do we see this a lot with, you know, the number one occupation of, of people committing suicide is actually firefighters. And we see wow. among the VA, uh, the Veterans uh, Administration, you, you hear about uh, returning soldiers committing suicide. And one of the primary reasons for both of those occupations is they've already come to grips with the fact that they're willing to die. Right. If you're going into combat at some level, you've made a mental shift that I may not come home from this. If you're a firefighter, you've already decided, I'm going to run into that, that burning building, even at risk of self, because there's a, there, th- those are noble causes, and there's a greater good, but once we've sort of crossed that line that I've, I've, I've come to grips with the fact that I might be dead, the capacity for self-harm, we see it, honestly, too, uh, people at higher risk for suicide are those who've had major surgeries, yeah. you know, heart surgeries, brain surgeries, the kind of surgery where you know, you've had to, you've had to maybe sign a will, right? And you've, you know, you, you kind of say your goodbyes, because I don't know if I'm going to come back from this illness. Yeah. Um, and so often we look and go, man, you've survived a major illness, why would you take your life? Well, they've already come to the grips with the fact that they might not be alive. And when you yeah. add that to the fact that I'm also feeling like I'm a burden, and I don't know where I fit. Um, by the way, those first two anyway, where do I belong? And, and man, I just feel like I'm a burden. Those are rampant, normal feelings in adolescence. Mm. If you feel those things, and that makes you start to think the world would be better if I wasn't here, please, I beg you, talk to somebody and let them challenge that truth by telling you uh, that you matter to them. Yeah, that's really good. All right, so my next question is, what are some preventative measures that we can take to stop something like depression? Uh, yeah, great question. And I, I, I think if we think of mental health and emotional health like any other form of health, uh, there, there are things we can do beforehand that make us maybe a little bit more resistant, uh, as well as there are treatments we can have if we end up find ourselves ill. We've kind of talked a little bit about some of the treatments, but there are some preventative things, and they're, they're not terribly uncommon or terribly different from what you do for your physical health. Yeah. One of the single most important things that you can do as a teenager, I know parents are probably going to listen to this and go, I don't give them permission to, but sleep. Like deep, <laughs> restful sleep. Yeah. One of the greatest interrupters of deep, restful sleep is your phone. So I would say put your phone down before bed. One of the greatest times of creativity of the human mind is just as you're drifting off to sleep and just as you're coming out of sleep. And usually with mm-hmm. teenagers and adults, the last thing we see before we shut our eyes is our phone. We're scrolling through social media. And the first thing we do when we wake up uh, is we grab our phone and we scroll through social media. Interesting thing that social media does is it actually causes in the human brain a fight or flight response, which is, you know, if a tiger walks in this room, right, it, there's an automatic response of fight or flight, either 
attack the tiger or run fast. Yeah. That when one is in fight or flight, you're actually not capable of being creative. Right? If a tiger comes running in the room, you don't go, oh my gosh, look at those stripes. And wow, the shades of orange as it ombres into his white belly. Like, <laughs> whoa, and look at the teeth and the shade. Like, no, you go, ah, right? It's, it's panic. Yeah. And when we hop on social media and we see the party we didn't get invited to, or we see the, 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 the thing that our friend said that doesn't sit right with us, it actually creates a fight or flight response, which is, is, a, is antithetical. It's not possible to be that and creative. Yeah. Now, the reason God creates us as we drift off, we get these long kind of looping what they call alpha waves and our brain just starts slowing down and it decompresses and it processes and all the things that we were, you know, worried about, our brain just starts creating solutions for it and creates really files in our brain as we sleep and as we dream mm -hmm. and it kind of puts everything in its right place. And, you know, if you think of like a cluttered desk, what happens while we're sleeping is our brain is making files and putting all the, the day's stuff in it. So when I wake up tomorrow, it's not cluttered. Yeah. If I don't get restful sleep because I was scrolling through social media and I go to sleep restless and then I wake up and I don't give my brain those last times to sort of file everything away and the hmm. solution I was thinking about, I interrupt it by going, I'm going to wake up and go right into fight or flight with social media and what I missed last night, right? It suddenly yeah. makes it difficult so deep restful sleep is the greatest thing that any of us can have uh for our mood that doesn't mean laying in bed and wasting time it means when i'm going to bed go ahead and go all the way to sleep and, and do it i would say yeah, eating great. right i would say uh regular physical exercise is one of the greatest things you can do for your mood uh if you don't play on a sports team or you know you don't like to you know, run or anything like that. I hate running. I was a professional athlete and I ran, you know, uh, as much as I'm ever going to run, I'm done running. <laughs> but ride a bike, climb a tree, go for a walk, go fishing. And when you're fishing, work the bank up and down. But something that has an element of physical activity. Yeah. I would say also preventatively is good relationships, man, a relationship with a, with a youth pastor, a trusted adult, uh, working on your relationship with your parents to where you can talk about the kind of things that are that, that you feel and not just sort of like how was practice today good how did you win yes but like man i'm excited that i won. use verbs of emotion right or yeah. uh, adjectives of emotion describe man i'm excited we won man i'm so bummed out that we lost i'm really frustrated with my coach incorporate some some words of emotion into your conversation with trusted adults mm -hmm. and um I think I think if you do those, you you got a good chance at at least creating the resilience. Doesn't mean depression won't come. Just like sometimes you trip and break your leg, right? Some sometimes yeah. it happens, but you'll develop the resilience on the front end that makes it less likely. Yeah, that's awesome. So, what does the Bible say about depression? That's a great question, since this is uh, a theology uh, uh, a podcast. It, it yeah. actually says qu quite a bit. And it may not say it directly, like this is how you handle depression and suicide, uh, suicidal thoughts. But the beauty of the Bible is it you really get to look at the heart of people. Yeah. And you see in the Psalms, man, David crying out. You see people speaking of despair. You even see Jesus himself in a garden crying so hard uh, in such anguish that the sweat coming out ceases to be sweat. It's blood, which... That, yeah. that means like the, the blood vessels in his head were starting to, to rupture from the, the pressure and the anguish that he felt. Like emotion's real. Uh, scripture wow. does not just sort of whitewash it and go, come on, be happy. It doesn't just put on a, a Christian face that says, I'm doing great. Praise the Lord, brother. Like people wrestle through the wide full range of emotion and some yeah. do it better than others. Some in their pain lash out and hurt other people. Uh, some in their pain, despair. Gosh, Paul even said, I despaired even of, of my own life. Like I wondered, like, uh, can I even take it? So you see some incredible men and women of God wrestling through really dark nights of the soul. And um, yeah. wow. yet what you see in all of them is despite feeling things deeply, there's in the back of their mind and they got to work it toward the front of their mind is that there's a God who's always good. Yeah. Where is he when my life isn't good? I don't know. But I know this to be true. He's good. 
He's, it's like saying, where's the sun when it's dark? I don't know, but I know, I know there is a fiery light in the sky. And if yeah, I, definitely. if I can hang on long enough, it'll be revealed where it, I, and I, and I may not know, ever know where it is in the middle of the night, but if I hang on long enough, I know that it will brighten my day. And so we, you see David, you see Paul, you see Jesus himself, you know, wrestling, hanging on till they see the goodness of God. God is good. He's always good, and he loves us incredibly. And in that, we can always take hope. So I think the, yeah. the, the bottom line of Scripture is that Jesus loves us. He's for us. Hang on when life's hard, man. Because you know what? Here's the other thing to realize is it's hard. Yeah. Sometimes as teenagers, we, we hit some bumps, and we think we're the only ones that are struggling with life. And that would make you normal. It would make you human. Uh, but the best way to, to handle it is to hold on to the fact that we have hope in God. And, and if I can keep, even if it's just in the recesses of my mind that God is good and is for me, and the more I read scripture, the more I see that he's good and for me, it makes it a little bit more uh, quick that I can kind of bring that sort of from the back of my mind to the front of my mind. Yeah. And you know what? It's still dark out, but doggone it, I'm going to fight this thing because I know the sun's going to rise in the morning. I know I'm not feeling well, but I'm going to hang in there because because uh, God is real. So I want to, the more I read scripture, uh, the more I'm around positive people of faith, uh, the more quickly I can access and bring to remembrance that God is good. And then I can, yeah. I can find myself in a place of hope. And you know what, if I can have hope that, that, you know, the sun's going to rise in the morning and I have hope that I can make it through today, all I got to do is get till tomorrow. And as long as I get till tomorrow, I'm always going to st stay alive. <laughs> yeah. Because, <laughs> Today is never tomorrow. So yeah. all you got to do is make it till tomorrow. Yep. Yeah, that's great. All right. I got one more question. Fire away, man. To wrap it up. So if you are struggling, or if we are as teenagers with depression and or suicide, who should we talk to about these things? Uh, yes, I would say um, your parents would be, um, would be uh, my first suggestion uh -huh. sometimes and i know you know sometimes it can feel like i don't know if i can talk to my parents about this they may overreact you know we have a lot of thoughts like that but i would say at the minimum a trusted adult yeah if if you're not comfortable with your parents but let me just tell you on behalf of parents that is something we do want to hear because w no matter what your relationship is like with your parents i promise you there is nobody on this planet that loves you more than they do yeah and while they may not always respond the way you hope that they would respond, um, they care and, and mm -hmm. they can be a very good asset. If you're not comfortable talking to them, I would say per perhaps uh, next would be my youth pastor uh, or senior pastor if we don't have a youth pastor mm -hmm. or a youth leader uh, but uh, or a teacher or a, a school counselor. School counselors are usually very well equipped uh, to have these conversations. Uh, if all else fails, a friend. Mm -hmm. But... The, the, the challenge with a friend is I promise you they're also having thoughts that they're struggling through. Yeah. And you want to talk to the best people to talk to are those that have already overcome the normal tumultuous cycle of adolescence. Yeah. It's normal. By the way, just having a thought about suicide doesn't mean you're suicidal. I, I really don't know any teenagers that haven't at least thought what the world would be like if they weren't there. Yeah. And have even thought, if I were to kill myself, I wonder how I would. That doesn't make you suicidal. It makes you normal as you're growing and learning and interacting with the world and thinking about things. Yeah. But if the, if the thoughts start to become recurring, I would talk to a trusted adult who has already navigated adolescence. So they're on the other side, and they can mm -hmm. help guide you to a place that you haven't yet been, and they can help guide you to a place that your friends haven't yet been. Yeah. You and your friends are guessing how to get there. Trusted adults like a youth pastor or parents know how to get there. Yeah, that is great. Yeah, thank you so much, Aiden, for uh, having this conversation. I think it's super duper important. And uh, man, I love your podcast. Thank you. Yeah. Hopefully you guys listening took a lot from this episode because this was just action packed full of great information. Man, we are so thankful that Pastor Keith did two episodes with us I mean not even one but two it was just super awesome powerful stuff and believe it or not we also have some more guests lined up for the future so get excited for those 
You guys know how we do things. We keep it real on the Teenology Podcast. If you guys missed any of the other episodes, go back and listen to them. And please, tell your friends about our podcast. You won't regret it. Follow us on Instagram at Teenology Podcast and send in any questions and topics that you want to hear about. Literally anything, please. We want to hear from you. <laughs> Don't forget, the Teenology Podcast is where teens make sense of the world that they are about to change. Hasta luego.